here comes somebody. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our Truth Be Told Memoir Forum here at the New Canaan Library. Uh, I'm really grateful to the library for offering us uh, this opportunity, and I guess we are part of the uh, November is Novel Writing Month uh, festivities here at the library, so we would like to... Uh, claim that we know the uh, techniques of fiction, but that we are definitely telling the truth. So <laughs> oh. there's a you know little discussion about that. Uh, I'll just mention quickly that I teach memoir writing uh, seminars out of my home. There is information on the spring memoirs uh, on the back table. And there's a sign-up sheet if you'd like to get an email when memoir workshops are about to begin. Okay. I'm Gail Howard. I've been teaching uh, memoir writing for a number of decades, depending on what I actually want to you know, own up to. Uh, and uh, I never get tired of it. The more I do it, uh, the happier I am. Uh, and the more fabulous stories I uncover. So uh, some of you might want to know, you know, really what is a memoir? Uh, we're saying it's the truth uh, told through storytelling. Uh, but many people make other kinds of assumptions about memoir. So let's start out with what a memoir is not. Um, it's not bragging. Um, it's not uh, complaining. Uh, it might tell where you were born, where you lived, what kind of work you do, but it's always more than that. A memoir is not a gossip column uh, or a tell-all about others' unfairness or crimes. A memoir often treats pain and loss, but its intent is not to simply blame others. Instead, a memoir is primarily a process of discovering and understanding the past. Well, you might say, well, I know the past. I don't need to discover it. but when you write down one memory, another one pops up that you didn't know was there. So in fact, it's discovering what you already know. No one feels the same way about the past, both before and after they write a memoir. So a memoir is a way of coming to terms with the past and it often lightens the burden uh, for people who have been through difficult experiences. Writers tell what happened as accurately as they can, but they also tell what it felt like to go through a particular experience and what difference it made, both then and now that the experience occurred. Now, there are different reasons to write a memoir. Many of us have figured out that when we go, the stories are going with us. And we don't really want that. We want our families to know what our lives were like. It's a good thing to pass these stories on. For others, as I have said, writing a memoir is a way of coming to terms with something difficult. So it doesn't have to be about your whole life. It can be only about a particular period or relationship. 
And some want to do both, to pass on the stories and to tell themselves the story of what it was like to be alive. A memoir is a gift to oneself and to one's family. It's hard to write. Any disagreement from the front row? Uh, but it's very good for the soul. So uh, what we're going to do now is hear from uh, writers who participated in the Reading Heritage Center Memoir Writing Workshop. They're each going to share a segment uh, of their memoirs. So I'm going to invite Kaya up to the microphone. I'm going to let you say your last name. <laughs> Thank you, Gail. The only reason I'm in Gail's class, why I took Gail's class, was because Ingrid made me. Uh, my mother was recently diagnosed with a terminal illness, and I wanted to get her to write her memoirs. She's had an amazing life, and I know very little about it. And so Ingrid said, I'm taking a memoir class. Come, come join us for this workshop. So I convinced my mother to do it. And so for weeks, we planned it and planned it. And I was going to do it with her, drive her, make sure we both participated in it together. And at the very last minute, she backed out. But I was there. And uh, Gail's right. I had no idea that my little life in rewriting it just to tell a story would take on a different meaning, a new color and a new shape. And in the storytelling aspect of some 48 hour period of my life, it changed in my mind and it really has been a valuable experience. So I highly recommend it to all of you. Dennis stood five feet, five inches tall. He was mostly bald with a ring of gray hair around the back of his head. He had a low waist, wide hips, and stocky legs. He was basically square. He had a wide gait, which was accentuated by cowboy boots that made him appear strong and determined. He wore boots all the time, work boots, muck boots, even shiny, snazzy alligator skin boots when he went out. He had a bulbous nose and one squinty eye, like Popeye. I have no idea how old he was, 55, 75. Everyone ages so differently. Dennis had never married and had no kids. He had traveled extensively and made his money from importing champagne and port. Now he traded stocks from his home computer and kept his small portfolio alive. He spent his days caring for his two and four-legged menagerie while pursuing more cerebral and fanciful amusements, music, poetry, inventions, and a few women, I'm sure. He kept specialty hens, a dozen mated unique pairs of exotic birds who supplied him with fresh eggs and plenty of mu amusement. Did you know that hens love to cuddle? When he first opened the coop to show me his birds, he picked one up like you would a rag doll cat, sort of around the waist, and he pushed her into my chest. Instinctively, I reached up to support her, and she pressed herself against me and began to coo. She would nuzzle my chin with her beak. She was this tiny sack of bones inside a huge balloon of feathers and down. I held her like a kitten, and I was completely in love. Dennis kept a short, squat, healthy quarter horse named Rosebud, who was pure muscle and low to the ground, just like Dennis, and a shepherd mutt mix named Wheelo, which often morphed into Freeload after a certain time in the evening when a certain amount of wine had been consumed. Dennis firmly believed that all dogs should have non-human names with two long vowels, Fido, 
hazy, willow. I couldn't argue with that logic. I met Dennis at a mutual friend's Halloween party in Tiburon, 20 minutes north of San Francisco. Michael. Michael was an ex-boyfriend who had moved to California a year before in order to be closer to his kids, and he'd invited me out for a week as we had remained friendly. It turns out that Dennis and Michael had been partners in the Port Champagne venture. Everyone else made a recognizable attempt at a Halloween costume out of respect for the host, or out of fear of being judged a coward. Dennis just wore a cowboy hat, his own. Afterwards, he invited Michael, the kids, and me to his house the following evening for dinner. I was on vacation, I had no other plans, Michael was in the driver's seat, and he said Dennis was a gifted cook. So I was quite happy to sit in the passenger seat and tag along. <clears throat> Dennis lived on a small ranch an hour north of San Francisco. Dinner at the ranch was magical. We sat at a very long and narrow redwood plank table that Dennis had built on, on a uh, redwood deck that Dennis had built, overlooking 100 acres of vines turning orange and purple in the October dusk. Dennis had planted those. Tiny Christmas lights dotted the deck from top to bottom. He was indeed a gifted cook and very generous with his wine collection. After dinner, while Dennis and Michael were visiting, I settled down by myself on the front porch, staring off at the vineyards. I was in shock, culture shock, I guess. I had been raised in rural Connecticut, but had been living in Stamford, which had been booming for 10 years, and there was cement everywhere. I had been living there for 10 years, burning out on the yuppie chase for the almighty dollar, longing to get back to a greener daily vista. I'm not sure how long I sat there looking out into the vineyards, my wine glass long empty, before Dennis appeared at the front door. He stood there silently for a few minutes, respecting my need for this view and this stillness. Nice view, huh? He was a man of very few words, and I found that simple comment hilarious. Unbelievable, I replied. I can't imagine living with this day in and day out. Silence. Why don't you hang out here for a few days, he said. I stared up at him, not quite sure what to make of this spontaneous offer. How to be tactful. I barely knew this man. How to be wise. This was clearly an intersection, one of those forks in the road. Was this foolish? Was it dangerous? Was he hitting on me? Or was this just one of those rare opportunities, generosity, that plops in your lap? Which was this one moment? I had no idea. So I said something safe. Well, I'm not sure how Michael would feel about that. I did come out to visit him. Dennis looked back at me and he said, Michael wouldn't care. And his girlfriend would be thrilled. <laughs> Ingrid. Thank you, Kaya. <clears throat> Thank you for coming. I always wanted to write about my mother, but never had the time. Not until I attended Gail Howard's seminar. I thought I could, under her <clears throat> I thought I could, and under her coaching and guidance, I found the time and realized that it is fun to write about the past. Thank you, Gail. <clears throat> this is the story of my mother, Kate Philip, who lived in Germany during both world wars and survived great difficulties, yet managed to maintain a positive perspective throughout her life. Kate li Kate's life was off to a rough start. She was born in Hamburg in 1906. Due to the Great War of 1914 and after the signing of the Versailles Treaty and the following hyperinflation of 1923, life was difficult in Hamburg. No money, food was scarce, so Kate was sent to relatives living in the country. 
All women in her family had been teachers, but motivated and determined Kate went to business school and got a job at the International Bank in 1926. On her way to the bank every morning, she passed a travel agency, where in the window she saw colorful posters of Guatemala, the country of eternal spring. After the severe winter of 1928-29, <coughs> which was the fifth coldest winter of the 20th century, she said to herself, what am I doing here? And without hesitation, applied for a transfer to the bank's branch in Guatemala City, about 6,000 miles away. Hans, my father, already working at the same bank in Guatemala, saw Kate's picture and read her resume. And he said, she is going to be my wife. He welcomed her at the train station where he greeted her with a large bouquet of flowers. Soon they fell in love, got engaged, and married back in Hamburg in 1933. The happy couple returned to Guatemala and started an import-export business. Hans was very good with numbers, and Kate was very good with customers. Life was good. They had two children, many friends, and a thriving business. But when the United States entered World War II in December 1941, and Guatemala declared war on Germany three days later, life changed drastically. Guatemalan officials confiscated the property of German citizens and arrested Hans, who was transported to Camp Blending in Florida <coughs> on January 6, 1942. My father was joined by more than 5,000 Germans living in Latin American countries at the time. In addition, more than 11,000 German citizens living across the United States were also interned. Those German civilian inmates, Hans among them, were later exchanged against Americans held in Germany. Before Kate had to leave Guatemala, she had time to straighten out the accounts. Her Guatemalan customers stood in line to pay their debts and to wish her well. At the same time, my father's share of the business reverted to his partner, Fernando Gonzalez. At the end of the war, Fernando Gonzalez made restitution. When the German wives and children were transported on a vessel to Europe, they were allowed to take one suitcase per person, as much as they could carry. The last port called before crossing the Atlantic was the island of Trinidad. British soldiers came on board and threw personal belongings, such as, such as typewriters and sewing machines, overboard. When they found no valuables in Kate's cabin, they became suspicious of her son's birthday cake on the table and smashed it. At the sight of the ruined birthday cake, I began to cry from atop the bunk bed, clutching my little doll tightly. I was upset by the soldiers and the ruined cake, but also afraid they might take my doll. Luckily, they paid no attention to my crying or my doll. I was relieved, but not as relieved as Kate, because the doll was in fact stuffed with jewelry, which proved essential to our survival during the next years. At some stressful months of certain, after some stressful months of uncertainty, there was a happy reunion of the family in Hamburg. <clears throat> because Hans had had to pledge not to fight against the Allies before leaving United States and could therefore be of no use to the German war effort, he was allowed to leave Germany on December 1943 to work for a German transport company in Spain. In April 1944, Kate, her children, got a visa to travel through Paris, France, to Spain. 
My father was waiting at the famous international bridge between Spain and France when he was told the French, that French railroads and train stations were heavily bombed and blown up by the Allies. The reason for this bombing was that the Allies were preparing for D-Day. He feared his wife and children were dead and started to cry. The Spanish border guards tried to comfort him and shared a bottle of brandy. That did not help him much in his misery. During the second bottle, they said, hey, a woman and two blonde children are crossing the bridge. He could not believe it. A delusion, a hallucination, too much brandy. No, it was Kate and their two children crossing the bridge. My courageous mother never lost faith and hopeful perspective. Until she died at the age of 91, she maintained her sense of humor, which she shared with all of us who loved her deeply and miss her every day. Any, thank you. Any questions? No? Okay, thank you. Good morning, or afternoon, I guess it is. Um, my memoir is about a time when I had three daughters married in one summer. It was a wonderful time, but a little bit hectic. It was 1979. My husband Pete and I were sitting outside our house enjoying the early fall weather of New England. The trees were just starting to turn yellow, and it was dry and cool. Pete made a passing comment. Most of the kids are in their 20s. Don't you think it's time someone got married? After all, we were 21 and 22. I felt the same way, but it was just a passing thought. Four months later, a few days before Christmas, we drove down to our house in Sea Pines in Hilton Head, where we always spent the holidays. We stopped at the local hospital to see our daughter, Carol, who had the house key. She was a nurse in a critical care unit, and she was expecting us. Carol had long, strawberry blonde hair, and she looked just like Alice in Wonderland. After hugs and kisses, she handed us the house key, and we spotted a sparkling diamond on her face on her ring finger. What's this, we asked. She said, Jim and I want to be married in August, she replied, grinning. And uh, what excellent news, we thought. This was the first daughter getting married. We liked her fiance. They had met in college, and he was an amazing guy. He'd been to graduate school and had a great job at a very fine company. So we felt good about it. After a week of beautiful weather, walks on the beach, and a wonderful Christmas holiday, we returned home to Reading. Three hours after we got home, the phone rang. It was Susan, our oldest daughter. Susan has short, dark hair and brown eyes. Susan was calling to invite us to D.C. for the next weekend, where she lived and worked, to see a basketball game at Georgetown. Pete loved basketball. I didn't care much. Susan had been dating a nice young man named John for several years, and because he was a terrific cook, he offered to make us dinner before the game. Apparently, his parents were coming also. So it would be six of us all together. When we arrived at the townhouse, John, John's parents were already seated in the living room. We said our hellos and joined them around the fireplace. John was tall and handsome with dark hair and blue eyes. He worked for a top six accounting firm and was very accomplished. We liked him. While John was preparing dinner, he came out into the living room to visit. After we were all settled, John cleared his throat as if to speak. But just then, John's father said, hey, Pete, 
What did you think of that last game? My husband and John's father launched into some banter about an old basketball game. So John went back into the kitchen. A short time later, he returned to the living room and cleared his throat again. <clears throat> I would like, but this time Pete interrupted. Hey, John, did you see? And cut him off. After 20 minutes, John was finally able to say his piece. We have something to tell you. We'd heard that one before. And I, Susan and I would like to get married in June. There were lots of hugs and giggles all around. Of course, we'd all known this was coming, and we were delighted. We finished dinner and went to the ball game, but I spent most of it pacing the hallway outside the arena. How was I going to host two weddings in two months? Susan now wanted June, and Carol was already scheduled for August. Back then, I was a principal in a real estate firm, and summer was an extremely busy time for me already. To make matters even more complicated, it turned out that both Susan and Carol wanted to wear my wedding dress. Carol was 5'8", and we just had it lengthened for her the week before. Susan was three inches shorter and now was getting married first. So we had it altered again to fit Susan. The seamstress thought we were crazy indeed. A few weeks after that DC weekend, our phone rang. It was Beth, daughter number four, asking if she could come visit us in Hilton Head in February. Of course, I said, you're welcome anytime. She called a week later and told us that her boyfriend, Sam, would be in town and asked if he could join us for dinner. Of course, I replied. Sam's parents had a house in Hilton Head as well, just a half mile away from ours. A week later, she called again and asked if she could invite his parents as well. So of course I said yes. Beth and Sam had met on the beach the year before. The tide was coming in and a large group of young people had moved up on the beach to avoid getting wet. Sam had been talking to Jean, our daughter number five, but when he discovered she was only 17, he started talking to Beth. <laughs> Apparently, they hit it off because he changed his flight home that weekend and flew into Springfield with Beth and then rented a car uh, in time to drive to Summit, New Jersey to get it to his job. They were smitten. So it was February 1980, and we were down in Hilton Head again with Beth, Sam, and his parents. After dinner, we were all watching a basketball game in the living room. Sam announced that he and Beth wanted to get married in October. Now, Sam was a great guy, but I could barely stand up to offer them my <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> Three weddings in five months. I was petrified. My mind was whirling. I had no idea how I was going to accomplish this. Thankfully, Beth did not want to wear my dress. <laughs> the next month was March. Susan reserved the church where Pete's grandparents had gotten married in 1882. They had been at that church's first wedding and Susan had our heart set on it. We raced around to complete all the arrangements by June. I found a florist in Bethel who agreed to provide all the flowers and bows for the church and reception, as well as bouquets for Susan, the bridesmaids, and the cake. Then I found a baker in Ridgefield who worked out of her home, who created a beautiful four-tier cake. Susan was an elementary school teacher, and she wanted her invitations to be sent without a reply card to her students, so they would have to handwrite a response. Thirty students invited to the wedding. We were all hoping for 30 declines, uh, <laughs> but alas, when the printer finished 
the invitations. They had mistaken my included a reply card, and there were no RSVPs. It was now only one month before the wedding. Susan's roommate came to the rescue and somehow managed to convince the State Department engraver to redo all 150 invitations. The day before the wedding, I was hosting 12 women for lunch at my house, the bridesmaids plus my family. I had someone coming in to help me, but she called at 5 a.m. Her brother had died, and she would be unable to help me. Oh, well, on to the next thing. I turned the water on in the sink, and nothing came out. <laughs> the well pump had just broken. Well, onward and upward. Fortunately, there were three 24-year-old boys sleeping upstairs in town for the wedding weekend, and I put them to work. My own two sons offered to help as well and, and stepped up, one of the friends stepped up confidently and said, Mrs. Driscoll, I was a cook at Boy Scout camp and I worked at McDonald's <laughs> one summer. My heart sank. <laughs> this did not fill me with relief. My neighbor said she had always wanted to shower a bride and so she did and all the bridesmaids too. I was serving chicken salad for lunch, but could not wash up afterwards without water. So my dear neighbor connected all of her garden hoses and dragged the lines over to my front lawn where I prepared the meal. Amazingly, Susan's wedding went very smoothly after that. Carol's wedding was next, scheduled for August 2nd. Carol was working as a nurse uh, at that time, when the local paper, the Reading Pilot, published their engagement, they listed, can you believe this? They listed Jim as the late Jim Cagdus. When they corrected it a week later, they removed the word late, but they kept the blank there so you could fill it in yourself, but failed to delete the empty space where the typo had been. It all looked rather strange. I had planned to once again host the bridesmaids for lunch, but our well went dry that morning. So I called the club and was relieved to hear that they could host us on the rooftop patio. On August 2nd, it was very hot. The church was not air conditioned, but the wedding was beautiful. The reception was at the spinning wheel because the country club was at that time too small to book a wedding but it all went off without a hitch. Two down and one to go. Beth and Sam were married on October 2nd, a gorgeous fall day at Pete's Family Church, the Sacred Heart Church in Georgetown. Beth wore her own lace summer dress and my mother's veil. She looked beautiful. Sam's mother kindly suggested that we just have a private ceremony with just the kids and both sets of parents. I guess she felt sorry for me. But of course I couldn't do that, having just given large parties for Susan and Carol. Um, the bridesmaid luncheon, my sister Jean Eckridge, who's here, said to my mother, why don't you have the bridesmaid's luncheon? Why don't, why don't you have it at Weeburn? And so she did. And um, Beth's rehearsal dinner was held at the Ridgefield Inn one of, one of their favorite restaurants. On the way home, less than a mile from our house, the car started to sputter. 10 minutes later, we rolled into our driveway to stop at the bottom of the hill. The car remained there for a full week <laughs> until a mechanic came out to look at it. Fortunately, he had brought a gas can with him. <laughs> um, for some reason, as if there were not enough going on, the New York Times kept calling. They called Susan, they called Carol, they called Beth, and finally me. None of us wanted to spend time talking to them, but they kept calling us. They had heard about the multiple weddings and just had to know why Beth 
was not wearing my wedding dress. So I finally caught on and told them, quite simply, that Beth was a size 10 and, then, and not a size 6. And then the call stopped. One more thing. One month before Beth's October wedding, Jean, our fifth and youngest daughter, called me from university to say that her boyfriend, Tim, of one year, had just given her a ring. <laughs> I, I couldn't say anything. It was just silence. And um, so, um, as a postscript, they did, the New York Times did send out a photographer to take pictures of the family, and they published an article about the perils of multiple family weddings. More recently, a follow-up article in the New York Times featured couples who had been married more than 25 years. All three daughters were interviewed for the article, as were Pete and I. It was the end of a wonderful summer. Not that I want to repeat it. <laughs> I am Ralph Welsh. I am a clinical psychologist and editor of a couple of newsletters and uh, the father of uh, four terrific children and five grandchildren and my better half is here. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this uh, fine group of people. Uh, some people say I, I was crazy to get involved, but these people are all crazy too, so <laughs> we, we're a nice, happy group. Uh, I was probably closer to my grandfather than any other member of our family. Uh, we were kind of uh, uh, kinfolk in, in many ways. And so I decided I wanted to talk about my grandfather. A young man was walking in the road in Payson, Utah, when a runaway horse and wagon came around the corner and ran the young man down. Seriously injured, he wasn't expected to live but he did. His name was Irvin Fairbanks, the member of a Mormon pioneer family who had come to Utah to be part of the building of the West. He was my grandfather, and I loved him dearly. Grandpa's grandmother, Mormon pioneer Jane Bryce, walked across the plains pushing a handcart under the worst of conditions. Her mother died on the track to the promised land. Grandpa's father, John B. Fairbanks, was a famous Utah artist who left a family of seven children to study art in France at the request of the Mormon church, leaving the family with nothing but a small farm to sustain them. <clears throat> My grandfather never forgave his father for what he considered a serious lack of responsibility and started throwing his father's letters from France in the trash. Letters he described as, quote, long sheets of paper involving instructions on how he and the older siblings could care for their mother and the younger ones, filled with piety, quotes from both the Bible and the Book of Mormon, and admonitions to attend church. He never forgave his father for what he considered to be an act of total self-indulgence. After returning from France, J.B.'s wife, Grandpa's mother, developed breast cancer and died. J.B. later married a 19-year-old girl at 62 years of age and had five additional children. One of the children from his second family, Dr. Avard T. Fairbanks, ultimately became the chairman of the art department at the University of Utah. A world-renowned artist himself, he sculpted the ram, which we all know as a symbol of the Dodge trucks for many years and was well known for his images of Abe Lincoln. 
To most of the family, J.B., a tall, thin, imposing man who sported a long gray beard most of his life, uh, I met him once when I was five, was always considered a family icon. To my grandfather, not so much. In spite of his lack of education, my grandfather was an avid student of history and was glued to the radio news, never missing Gabriel Heater, you remember him? at noon, or Walter Winchell on the radio at night. Periodically, he would run down the car battery listening to the news, no transistors then, and would need a jump for his car. Grandpa was a genius when it came to world history and gardening, but provided the entire family with a litany of chuckles and periods of high anxiety when it came to his driving. Grandpa never owned a car he could not dent, nor one he could not keep on the right side of the road. Riding with Grandpa was always a nail-biting experience, and I sat in the death seat next to him many a day going to work with him, painting houses during my college years. Grandpa, who could barely see over the steering wheel, loved to reminisce while driving, and the more he became engaged in his rhetoric, the slower he drove, and the more he wandered all over the road. When he sensed he was in the wrong lane, he would jerk the car to the right and nearly go off the road, into a curb or a ditch or onto the other side. He backed into cars, parked on the opposite side of the street, and tore off many a rearview mirror, backing his car up. <laughs> One day, Grandpa came to work with a dent in the hood sands his hood ornament. My cousin Ray, who also worked with us summers and weekends, his father was our boss, noticed a dip in the hood of an already dented Fraser automobile and casually remarked, gee, Grandpa, it looks like he ran under the back of a flatbed truck. <laughs> Grandpa sheepishly remarked, ah, well, yes, I did. <laughs> But the good thing is the fact that that sharp ornament is now gone. You know, I could have hit someone on a bicycle, and then that ornament could have done a lot of physical damage. Ray replied, good thinking, Grandpa. The next time you hit someone on a bike, you can thank your lucky stars that hazardous object was previously removed. The ornament was indeed dagger-like far different than the magnificent Dodge Ram created by his illustrious uh, half-brother. Uh, Grandpa's pragmatism was, of course, hard to refute. On another occasion, Grandpa was bragging about the fact that he had taught himself how to drive with no help from anyone, and Ray casually remarked, yeah, Grandpa, you did. Uh, but did you ever consider the fact that you might have had a fool for a teacher? The remark was met with a sheepish grin. Grandpa had the worst diet one could imagine, but little was known at the time about the evils of cholesterol. At our sumptuous Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners, he would, we would all gather, uh, he would gather all of the fat, cut off the meat, pile it on his plate, and happily gobble it down. Can you imagine? His favorite part of the turkey was the tail. He would drink an entire can of condensed milk at one swig and seemed to be addicted to anything that was loaded with cholesterol or all of those food items we now know are not good for us. Grandpa got along with virtually everyone and his laugh and good cheer was infective. The glaring exception to the good nature was my Aunt Lorraine. To be blunt, Aunt Lorraine was a piece of work. Aunt Lorraine was a shrill, thin, attractive woman with long blonde curls. She appeared to delight in baiting my grandfather. Upon entering grand, uh, grandma and grandpa's house, war was declared. Invariably, Lorraine would win the battle and grandpa would angrily leave the house, sit in his car and listen to the radio until the battery died. We always made sure that jumper cables were available whenever Lorraine was due for a visit. <laughs> Family lore suggests that my grandmother Fairbanks was clairvoyant. 
She always seemed to know things that were happening well beyond her purview. One experience has always been hard to refute, since it isn't something a family normally would discuss. My grandmother had gone to North Carolina to visit relatives, and my grandfather stayed home to work. During her visit, my grandfather received an angry call from my grandmother in North Carolina who shouted at him, Irvin, remove your hand from the widow Smith's knee right now. He quickly complied. <laughs> Admitting this event actually occurred, he told me that this rather traumatic experience ensured that he had a life of marital fidelity. Although Grandpa was generally a placid, good-natured person, except with Aunt Lorraine, he did like a good argument, but mostly they were in fun. One day, things apparently went a little too far, and he came home from work with a black eye. Short, stocky, and in his early 60s, he sheepishly told the family that one of his fellow workmen took issue with his remarks. They got into a scuffle and he ended up with the black eye. Grandma was visibly angry that Grandpa, and, and Grandma was always right. Uh, she probably put a slab of beef over, over the injured eye. Grandpa had a view of life that was truly ebullient. To him every day, rain or shine, dusty or muddy, it was still, quote, a beautiful day. To this humble house painter, philosopher, life was a wonderful experience to drink in no matter what. He firmly believed that life was a grand experiment of nature to be completely embraced and appreciated each and every day. And his garden was a magnificent creation of artistic dimensions. I have no idea why he never learned how to drive a car properly. <laughs> but he didn't. My grandfather's diet caught up with him at 68. He had a stroke, but recovered following that event. Had numerous angina attacks, but kept working for his son Arlo, painting houses, as I did weekends and summers. We were buddies while we painted, even though he frequently had to take breaks due to the pains in his chest. We talked about everything imaginable, and he was a wealth of folk wisdom. He was interested in every class I was taking at the University of Utah, and seemed to more, know more than he should about every subject. He died at 72. It was probably the worst day of my life, but he did leave me his banged-up car, which I drove even after that. It was T-boned, and, and I drove it even after it was T-boned by another car. It looked pretty bad, didn't it, Jane? <laughs> she used to be ashamed to get into the car, but she did. In fact, I continued to drive it with that large recess in one side, much to the chagrin of my future wife, Jane, until it finally gave up the ghost. It was his final legacy, having given his car to a person who appreciated a really beat up, badly dented car the type of vehicle he personally drove his entire life. To me, I revered and admired this cheerful, loving, elfish house painter far more than his, and, and, and admired him far more than his famous painter father, J.B. Fairbanks. Herb. I hope your enthusiasm continues until after I finish my presentation. <laughs> As you can see so far, our talks are very diversified and, and on many subjects. My name is Herb Watson. I live in North Bethel, Connecticut. <clears throat> I'm a retired corporate uh, environmental engineer and uh, safety and health, and uh, enjoyed working in an industrial plant for some 45 years before I retired. My talks are a little bit different, and everybody's talk is a little bit different. 
I have a couple of little vignettes. I'm a uh, <clears throat> Korean War veteran, um, having joined the service when I was 18, just a month after high school. I'm going to read a couple things, and I hope you in, are indulgent by my conversation. This is Memorial Day this past May. <clears throat> Last May, I watched the Memorial Day celebration on television. Time has a peculiar way of either moving very slowly or very quickly. It was held on the Capitol grounds in Washington, D.C., and was an excellent <clears throat> tribute to the men and women who had served and who had fallen serving our country. It's been 55 years since I was honorably discharged from the Army, yet my time in the military is nearly always on my mind. I now belong to three veterans organizations, the Korean War Veterans, the American Legion, and Veterans of Foreign Wars. I am blessed with a very good memory. I can recall my early childhood. In writing my memoirs over the past four years, some thoughts that I have tenderly stored now come flooding back. Most memories are good, but I do harbor some things from my dark side. Thankfully, though, there are only a few of these. My sister Jacqueline, a year younger than I, planned to be a teacher. My parents were unable to send both, excuse me, both of us to college at the same time. I knew if I qualified for the Korean GI Bill of Rights, it would help pay for my college tuition, and my parents would be able to send my sister to school. I enlisted in the Army Infantry just after my 18th birthday without telling my parents. It was my decision, and we never discussed it. I chose the Army for several reasons. As a volunteer, one had to serve eight years to qualify for the J.I. Bill of Rights. While the Army, while the Navy and the Marines required four years of active duty, the Army only required three plus five years of reserved after that. As a volunteer, I could choose what type of job training to pursue. I liked the uniform better that the Army had. We had zippers. The Navy had buttons. When you have only 60 seconds to go, zippers beat buttons every time. What people don't realize is that initially the Army uniforms had buttons too, but everyone got to their tailor to swap them out for zippers as soon as possible. I went to boot camp in Kentucky for 16 weeks of advanced infantry training. Then I trained for an additional six weeks in Japan as a quartermaster supply personnel. Then before we, shipped to, we were shipped to Korea, my Catholic buddies all had a chaplain bless their silver crosses. Though I was a mere Methodist, I was eager to be part of that group and appreciated all the extra protection that I could find. So I had he bless my cross in a small steel covered Bible which I kept in my left shirt pocket, covering my heart for the next two years. I found comfort in that. At times in war, one can feel either scared or invincible, or both at the same time. <clears throat> and being at war does one, does things to one's soul. Without God or faith, a young soldier can be very lonely in a foxhole. The object in war is to survive to fight another day. I believe people are not born heroes, but rather are given the opportunity to, to become one when the circumstances present itself. One's action during wartime encounters can last a, long, a lifetime. We can replay them endlessly in our minds. What if? I normally march at the local Memorial Day parade in Bethel, but I didn't this year. Last year's march was uphill most of the way and a stiff breeze, and being a flag bearer was more of a challenge than I care to repeat. I'm satisfied to view the scene in the parade on a 42-inch 
high-definition television set in my living room. I pause. My next little memoir is, is called, uh, these are army thoughts, and one size fits all. And after you hear this, you wonder how any military man ever survived. <clears throat> Upon my first real impression of this was when I was used, when I was issued my first military clothing. I was 18 and weighed 185 and was 5'11", wore a size 10 and a half D shoe. My waist was 34 and I wore a large size shirt with about a 15 and a half inch neck. I was introduced to the army substitute sizes for boots. I ended up with a size E double E boot and was told that this was an equivalent to a 10 and a half D shoe. I was also told that the OD military socks were very thick and would compensate for any extra width of the boot. At 18, I did not think the substitute size was appropriate, but who was I to judge? I also was also instructed that if you could button your shirt, it was a good fit. This is my first evaluation of the phrase, one size fits all. Amusing, but not so funny at the time. I'm gonna indulge you with one more little memoir. Some memoirs are humid, I'm sorry, are humorous and some are not. This is an, all these memoirs are actually life stories and are, and are true. <clears throat> my last memoir is called, That Is Not My Car in Our Cellar. Bang. I'm okay, said my son, Kenneth. I did not do it, Mom. As a cloud of dust bellows through the hallway of our home in Bethel, Connecticut. Shortly before the explosion, my wife Carolyn and her girlfriend Marie were having coffee in our kitchen. She immediately thought our 14-year-old son, Kenneth, was playing with his chemistry set. She rushed to his bedroom and found him lying on the floor. The explosion had knocked him down. She found no visible damage to the room or to my son or to our son. When she and Marie went downstairs to the basement, she saw the front end of a very large black sedan sticking through the foundation. The impact from the car took out the electricity and moved the garage door off its hinges. She immediately called me at work. I was in Norwalk. And in a very panicked mode, she said, Herb, there's a car in our cellar, and it is not one of ours. <laughs> It seems this car must have rolled down the street into our sloped driveway, avoiding our split rail fence, and struck the corner of our foundation and ripped out several cement blocks, creating a large hole. I can see the snow outside through the opening, she said. I quickly left work in Norwalk and drove to Bethel. It was the middle of December, and it took me over an hour to drive home to inspect the damage. Shortly after arriving home, my neighbor and his sister-in-law came over because she thought her car had been stolen and had already called the police to report the theft. The police arrived soon after my arrival and found her car impaled into our foundation. <clears throat> The woman had apparently forgot to apply her handbrake and left the transmission in neutral. The car rolled down the hill two houses away and impacted, and the impact sent several cement blocks some 20 feet into our backyard. Being a licensed industrial electrician at the time, I fixed electrical service temporarily. I also installed several sheets of plywood to cover the damage but the mice loved the easy access to our cellar and the mice hunting was great for the next couple of months. My neighbor had called the towing service to extract her car from our foundation. She was not happy 
with the service that that company had provided and later sued the company for damage to her car's rear end. She never apologized to us for the damage that she caused our house because she blamed the car's manufacturer. What a nice neighbor. <laughs> it's too bad that, it, you didn't, that they didn't pay a bounty for mice hunting. It would have been a great source of income. Thank you. <laughs> As, as you can see, writing memoirs is fun. I did it because I know who I am, but my children, who are three boys in their 50s, don't know me, really. And my five grandchildren certainly don't know me either. So this is my way of passing on my thoughts of life. There you go. Okay. I hope you enjoyed those stories. I, uh, you, you can see why I enjoy teaching this class, because there are so many of these wonderful tales, and they all deserve to be written down. So uh, does anyone have questions for any of today's readers? Anybody at all? Uh, OK, wonderful. Any questions about uh, memoir writing? Or are you just all kind of taking it in, thinking about it? Sure. Okay, good. Uh, well, thank you for coming today. Uh, we enjoyed uh, entertaining you. And again, uh, if you're interested in a memoir workshop somewhere down the road, um, there's a sign-up sheet down there. I'm sorry it's handwritten, but today was the day my printer chose to stop. Uh, but it's in league with all other printers, so, you know, yes, you had a question, sir. Do you recommend or suggest a topic for your writing? Well, I give them uh, a set of uh, six assignments, uh, and we start uh, at the beginning with a uh, mini autobiography, uh, I ask everyone to tell their life story in five pages, which, of course, is torture. Uh, but it turns out you can do it. And then you've kind of got it laid out in front of you. And then we go back and start with childhood uh, and then talk about uh, a figure who uh, influenced you, either a parent or grandparent. That's where we got Ralph's uh, wonderful story about his grandpa and um, Ingrid's beautiful story about her mother. Uh, and then we look at things uh, that are a little bit more difficult, like a uh, loss or a turning point uh, in life. Um, and uh, we write about place, which is another kind of angle into what mattered in your life and, and what influenced you to become the person you are today. So those are the kinds of things uh, that we work with. Uh, and then, you know, once people have uh, worked on those assignments, they can kind of go off on their own then and decide um, what's most important to write about. Can I make a comment? Uh, mm -hmm. you know, when she said, write your life history in five pages, I said to you, remember? You got to be kidding. Of course, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and when I sat down, the computer, it's doable. But you leave a little bit out. <laughs> the bad part. Do you recommend it uh, out of time, people read five minutes or something like that? In the workshop, I, we keep them relatively small so that everybody gets a chance to read for maybe five to seven minutes, and then uh, the other writers respond, um, and then I add some comments. I always want members of the workshop to speak first, uh, so they don't all wait for me to come up with the magic you know, answer. And now, uh, uh, particularly with this group and another wonderful group that I'm working on in Reading, um, people say to me, well, 
do you mind the fact that you can't get a word in edgewise? Um, and I say, absolutely not. That's when I know my job is done. You know, I've got everybody thinking about what successful writing is. So, yeah. Well, um, sure. Uh, it's not that you can't write. It's that you haven't practiced enough. Um, we all talk all the time. If we didn't talk all the time, we wouldn't be very good at talking. You know, um, you know how to use language if you can talk. Uh, you have to practice writing. And the more you practice, the better you get. You can't get worse, you know. Practice makes you better. And practicing in front of an audience makes you doubly aware uh, of whether you're getting your message across. So you have to be patient with yourself uh, and keep working to build your writing skills. I also recommend doing lots of reading of memoirs. And there are, you know, memoirs are big now. They're in. Uh, and there's many, many uh, beautiful books. Uh, you can read uh, different books and steal people's techniques. You can't steal their words but you can steal their techniques. That's completely legit. So through a process of reading um, and practicing writing, um, people who did not think they could write turn out to be very good. I think there was another question. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. No, um, I, I hope I give feedback that people find is uh, specifically useful. Uh, often, you know, a very common problem is uh, not including enough detail, not including enough uh, sensory detail so that your readers can picture what's going on in their minds. Uh, setting a scene. Uh, working on dialogue, all of these things are ways to liven up a story so that you're not um, telling, you're actually showing. Um, those are things that we work on regularly, and that, that helps any kind of writing. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Anybody in this group uh, given memoir writing a try? Okay, great, wonderful. Good. I, you know, um, sometimes it can be frustrating when, uh, you know, you feel like you're stuck or you feel like you're not able to get your message across. But um, almost all of the time, if you keep at it, um, you will find a solution. But, you know, there's nothing like having a group because one of the things you can steal is uh, the techniques that people in the writing workshop are using. And people often find great new ideas by just seeing, oh, I did what she did. Okay, I'm going to do that, you know, that kind of thing. So working in a group is good. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, did you outline your work from the beginning? Oh, I love it when people do that. I am incapable of outlining work from the beginning. I just jump into the middle and go whichever way. And then when I'm kind of halfway through, then I say, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Where is this going? All right, let me do some kind of outline. So yes, you, there's the orderly part of your brain, you know, that is going to say, hey, you know, what, what's, you know, where is this going? And the other part of your brain that just says, oh, I've got to write about that incident, you know, or I got to talk about my grandmother, and you just plunge in. And you kind of go back and forth between the very creative and the very orderly. Everyone has their own way of doing that. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to make a comment. But something that happened that kind of surprised me, I did a memoir writing workshop here in the community for a couple of years. Great. Is that I was writing about my early childhood. Mm -hmm. And I would go to bed at night thinking about it and remembering more and more details. And I'd wake up during the night and more details in the morning. Wonderful. I'd wait to get the computer. Great. So you'd write it all down. It would actually help a lot with sleep. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I hope. I hope you got uh, to the point where you could sleep through the night and not have to jump up and write things down. But you know, it's worth it for a while. Um, but I, you know, I can't emphasize enough the fact that um, as you write, 
uh, more memories simply bubble up to the surface. It's like you're peeling off a sheet, and then underneath it, there's another layer you didn't know was there. And Ralph. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, uh, I have been uh, writing uh, a book which involves uh, a lot of the work I did, clinical work and other activities, and I uh, had a uh, part about my autobiography in there. Mm -hmm. And then when I, after this workshop, I went back and I thought, my God, how dry is this? <laughs> but, uh, by, by doing a workshop, uh, what you do is you realize, look, uh, get away from this uh, academia kind of approach, even a book which is uh, primarily about work that I did academic. But I went back and found out that I could liven that up and make it more, much more interesting than it was simply on the basis of realizing some of those things that I learned in this workshop. One of which, of course, is uh, the, you know, putting in some humor and uh, painting the picture. I think the, the more difficult thing when you're writing academically, uh, it gets to be extremely dry. And I, I don't think that's necessary. I think one could yeah. can, uh, convey information. I think more people are going to read it uh, if it's interesting. And so I looked at some of my colleagues that have written book, books like Wayne Dyer and other people, and they know how to paint the picture. And they know how to sell the books. And I think selling a book, uh, if it's an academic type book, requires some of the things, the kind of techniques, the kind of ideas that we were asked to deal with in, in this workshop. So I yeah. Think, you know, I think it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great, great idea. Well, I've had uh, a number of writers come into the workshop, um, academic writing, uh, journalists, uh, and people who have been told that good writing involves keeping your own feelings out, okay? And I'm saying, no, put your feelings in. So the journalism, uh, the reporter who's in my workshop now said, well, I interview people and I want to hear what they feel, but it's not about how I feel. So I said, well, now you got to interview yourself. Okay, that she could figure out, you know, that's what she was going to do. So, um, yes, I, I think liveliness uh, and depth are the things we're looking for in a memoir. Uh, it's not just, you know, um, if you go to a bookstore and take five memoirs off the shelf and look at how they start, okay? None of them starts with, I was born on September 8th of 1932, you know, no, okay? they almost always drop you right into a scene, okay? They're hooking you in to the liveliness of the life that is being described, okay? So there are some techniques uh, that we help people with in the workshop that are useful in, yeah, as Ralph said, in any kind of writing. Yes? Okay. But I found that uh, I could take a period of my time or a certain passion of mine and write a bunch of stories about those, like stories about cars or being in the Navy and so forth. Mm -hmm. and then I take them to the computer, it's so easy to write them up. I take them down to Staples and they write them up. I put pictures in and they come up with something like this where they uh, put this in a folder. Right. End of it here. And then if you want to change a page, you just pull that off and put it in. Mm, sure. They can scan it if they want and make an ebook out of it. But the, those are the nice things. My son just asked for all of mine. Good. For, for his records. For Wonderful. His, for his children's grandchildren. 
That's wonderful. Uh, I've recently asked a group to think about what they would want to read in their grandmother's memoir. So think about what you would like to discover about your grandmother's life. And those are the kinds of things that your grandchildren will want to read in your work. They won't just want to know where you were born. They'll want to know what it was like to be you. Every life is unique. You know, unique is a word that gets way overused. But yes, each one of us is unique, and our experiences are unique. We each have a story. and. Uh, Perhaps everyone in the world isn't interested in it. Your family certainly is. And you don't even know how interesting your story is until you actually write it. OK, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Yes. You're not just writing about you, the individual. You're writing about a particular time and a particular place, even though you don't realize you're doing that. But you are. You're actually adding to the historic record. What was it like to be in a household in the 50s? as you are saying. What was that like to be a mom um, or a, uh, a woman worker? Uh, one of the uh, wonderful uh, writers in my Tuesday workshop uh, wrote about uh, trying to figure out whether um, there was a hard and fast rule about women wearing pants to work or whether it was something, you know, like, yeah, now, something, you know, like an unwritten rule that she had simply failed to perceive. So she kind of asked around. Her father actually worked at the same place, so she was grilling him on, you know, what, what exactly is, you know. So uh, he said, I don't, you know, I don't think there's any rule. So uh, one day she just showed up in pants. And she was thinking, you know, she was going to make at least a little bit of a, you know, like she was afraid to do it. But on the other hand, she thought, let's see what people think, you know. Well, no one said anything to her, nothing, nothing at all. So she got back in the car to drive home with Dad, and she said, you know, <laughs> nobody said a word about this. Nobody even looked at me funny. I mean, it, it, I mean, really, nobody said anything. And Dad said, are you kidding? That's all they were talking about. In every building on, in the, this, it was Monsanto or something like that. I mean, that's it. And the next day, half the women who worked there showed up in pants. You know? <laughs> so we're, again, when you're writing your story, you're writing about that time. And those are the kinds of things you're going to be able to uh, talk about incidents that really enrich and embellish everyone's understanding. Yes, ma'am. Oh, great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And what was that really like? Yes. Yeah. So it's like you're giving people a chance to see a movie in their minds of things that are long past now. So, yes, consider yourself providing a service to the larger, you know, reading public when you write your memoir. Okay? Yay. All righty. Thank you again. Thank you very much to my wonderful uh, and very unruly uh, Reading memoirists here who refused to sit at the table. But uh, I hope everybody enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you are very welcome.